Thank you so much. No, thank you so much, everybody. Um, yeah, and good morning. Um, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here and to share some of the, the more unseen world out there in the Okavango area and in the catchments. Um, uh, fungi generally don't always get all the attention, so it was a pleasant surprise for me when I got asked to, to come and look at fungal diversity in Angola as part of this project. Uh, because generally they, they have been some of the forgotten organisms until they start causing death and destruction and, and disease, which is not what all fungi do. Um, <coughs> fungi and, and many of the microorganisms are actually generally good guys, and it's only when they're taken out of their natural environment and moved around the world um, and where humans have disturbed ecosystems that they turn into to problem creatures. Otherwise, they play very important roles um, in the world. So fungi have been known by many different names. Um, unfortunately, in, in European or westernized cultures and so on, mostly in negative contexts, um, often called death angels, devil's bread, golden destroyers, things like that. And then some of the more alternative people venturing into the psychedelic, uh, the, uh, the other sides of them and calling them magic mushrooms, etc. Um, but a lot of cultures in Africa, South America and Asia know them in a completely different way and know them for their medicinal properties and know them as important sources of food um, and highly value them as alternative alternative sources of nutrition during certain times of, of the year. Um, they featured in Western cultures many places. Some of you that know Alice in Wonderland will know that she had encounters with mushrooms, eating on the one side of a mushroom. They got bigger, other side things got smaller. Um, They've been used in cartoons, movies, etc. So they're all around us, as Paul said, infecting and slowly hiding here and so on, um, and form important components of ecosystems. Um, the scary fact is that less than 5% of fungi internationally, globally, have been provided with names. And there's still a lot of argument as to how many species there actually are. The more conservative, but Generally, traditionally more accepted that estimates are that it's around 1.5 million species of fungi in the world. Um, more recent estimates are that it's probably between 2.5 to 4 million species in the world. Um, with molecular biology and environmental sequencing and so on, many people are saying, no, this is way underestimated. We're looking at you know, 20 plus million species of fungi in the world. Um, one of the more recent papers from Chicago where you know, your, your global diversity plants, animals, etc., where plants had a percentage there when they split plants from fungi, because fungi are definitely not plants, they're closer to, to insects and animals. When they split that, that from plants, you suddenly started seeing fungi appearing on, on all these graphs and a publication that came out end of last year show um, the estimate for fungal diversity being equivalent to the insects, so around 7.4, 7.3% of, of diversity, and then they've got this whole bacterial thing in there, and the animals have shrunk, and everything else has shrunk. So these debates continue. There's a lot of these things that you can't grow. You can't see them, first of all. You can't culture them. Um, but with the molecular techniques, we're starting to learn a lot more about them um, and their importance in ecosystems. So, as mentioned, they're not only bad guys, they do cause diseases of plants, animals, humans, but they're also important sources of foods, medicines. Um, they provide us with important sustenance, wine, beer, cheese, etc., soy sauce, many different things. They've often been described by the mycological community, uh, mostly the, the mycologists feel neglected and so on. They've been called the orphans of Rio, um, many different reasons for all these things. Um, but if there's several good initiatives internationally that have been looking at addressing this and European countries now have red lists for fungi also, something that in Africa, of course, and even in South Africa um, does not exist yet. It's, it's only really up in the UK and Europe that there's a few strong um, 
com uh, people fighting for fungi and their importance and recognizing their roles in, in the environment. Um, they are taxonomically complex, um, and that's been one of the challenges of, of working in Angola also. Um, I must admit that I've been overwhelmed by the results that you know, essentially eight days in the field have resulted in. Um, and then starting to compare this with what is known internationally and what's been published, even from as close by as Zambia or you know, DRC in South Africa. Many of the things that on macromorphology look similar um, based on, on the initial DNA work that I've managed to do they're, they're novel species. Um, you know, they're not what they, they seem to be on macromorphology. And that has been a problem in mycology for the last 20 to 30 years since DNA sequencing and so on came onto the scene. A lot of things that seem to be one species or one genus even has turned out to be multiple genera. Um, it's been a bit to and fro. So uh, a genus that I'll show you some, some examples from uh, Angola of. No, in November, it, there were six, seven genera from Angola. Then December, a paper comes out that puts these seven genera into one genus again. So there's daily these changes in, in the taxonomy and, and the systematics of this group, which makes it a little bit trickier to come to exact numbers. Um, but you'll see, hopefully, that you know, despite all that and these uncertainties at the moment, um, Angola has a, a very rich diversity of macro fungi and really for the the two short trips that I've done I focused on the macro fungi the things that you can see with with the naked eye um, and easily collect and the things also that local communities have been collecting um, as food sources and medicines etc so going back a little bit as to what's known for Angola if you google Angola and fungi you come up with food mostly derived from fungi um, and not fungi, and I say you get the fungi coming up, not the fungi. But then, second or third down the line, Angola has a rich history of, of fungi, mushrooms, and so on. They've had some beautiful stamp editions of various fungi of Angola on their stamps in, in history. Um, in the formal scientific literature, very little known. Um, and are looking at, at this biodiversity data, GBIF and so on, you'll see for fungi in Angola, there's at least 577 occurrences listed here. But these are all in the last few years, and it's mostly these things that are pathogens of crops. So what's killing the cotton, what's killing the coffee, what's killing the, the beans, that type of thing. When it comes to the bigger guys, <coughs> apart from some of the early work, um, done by Valvich and a few others later, there's hardly anything in the formal literature on the macro fungi, even the edible fungi of Angola. Um, so, um, and this despite the fact that as you drive through Angola, um, and as I talk to people, the local communities know about fungi, they collect them by the thousands every year, sell them at markets, etc. So the informal information um, if you want to call it informal, the local information is there and it's, it's a matter of tapping that and realizing the importance and the, the use of fungi, the macro fungi to, to people in these areas um, that we're working in also. So looking at the, the two collection trips that, that I've been lucky enough to go on and the first one maybe five days in the field in between the, the driving etc and so on and the second one about the same. Um, focused on the big guys that you can see easily and collect because if I were to go to the smaller guys that you can hardly see or can't see with the naked eye then you know, it would get into the thousands but ended up collecting just over 400 specimens um, which tried to identify based just on, on macromorphology which is very inaccurate in, in fungi um, tried to collect some material that I could take for herbariums and then for DNA sequencing to at least you know, get a, a level of barcoding done, focusing only on the ITS up to now. Um, from those 400 specimens, there's at least 50 genera there, um, many of macrofungi, uh, 
being a, a collector by nature, I couldn't always just focus. And if the, the, the macro fungi pickings got a bit slim in the drier areas, looked at other things, a few rust fungi, a few other things collected. Um, but macro fungi wise, 50 genera. If I look species wise, this 50 genera, um, some of the genera, there's 10 or more species that I've collected amongst the, the 400, others at singles, but at least 150 species or more so far. Um, and a lot of these, based on ITS sequence data, they are very few of them are actually matching with what's in GenBank or some of the fungal um, sequence databases. That does not necessarily mean that they're novel species because there's a big discrepancy between what's been described for fungi and lodged in herbaria and other collections and what has been sequenced and is available in your, your international sequence databases. So some of these, even though they might not have sequences, might not be novel species. And that's where the challenge comes in. So many of these collections are split all over the place. Um, like we heard this morning, and things collected by Portuguese are now in, in the Paris herbariums or museums and things, and tracking this down, um, not that easy. Um, so I'm not going to you know, be able to show you everything that even in these few days in the field I managed to collect and, and photographs and things that, that I've seen and so on. So I'll highlight a few, show you a, a lot of photographs and so on, um, just to introduce you to, to the beautiful world of fungi um, in Angola. And I'll start with some of the, the broader categories. Um, wood rotters, um, very important. They decay, um, break down, recycle, um, help in the nutrient cycle. One genus, um, Trametes. This is the one that used to be six genera until November. Now it's one genus again. Some of the very common ones you see a lot of in these areas. This big one, it's a white rot fungus. But these white rot fungi and the brown rots, they're important. They create cavities in trees for birds and animals and those pesky bees to, to nest in. Um, so playing important roles in the ecosystem. This one, see very commonly, loves to grow on burnt wood and in full sun, also decomposing, recycling. Flavodin, same thing, often on dead branches. Um, this little guy, Polyporus, um, also a decomposer, so to your Lentina species. Um, this one grows especially in tropical areas, same thing, decomposer, so the good guys. Then these guys with the bad names, death caps for example, your Ammonita species, where us Europeans um, or people with European descent and European people fear them because they're mostly poisonous ones in the northern hemisphere. In Africa, many of the species are very edible and some of the most sought after edible species in African countries. A um, lot of them in Angola, that, that's one of the, the genera with the, the most species that I picked up in the few days that I've been able to, to collect there. Just showing some of the variation and morphologies, this one with the knobbly head, warty heads, pinks and whites, um, small and big, um, and this one is one of the, the edible ones. <coughs> then the boletes, they're especially well known as mycorrhizal fungi, so too the ammonites actually, they're all mycorrhizae living in the soil, helping trees and plants to grow. Um, quite a few boletes collected there also. Europeans, again, know them as being very edible. The African species, not that well known as being edible because there's the Ammonites and the Termidomyces and then the, uh, the, the Cantharella species that I'll show you that are much better eating. Uh, but again, an incredible diversity of, of genera and species there and this little one that they call in, in China they call it the old man of the woods because of the, the beard um, as they call it um, important mycorrhizal fungi then little guys those were big these guys are maybe one centimeter in height so you've got to get down on your knees they call them pink gills but a lot of them are a lot of other colors they get the name pink gills because their spores are pinkish in color and you can see some of the spores accumulating there. So again, lots of different ones um, found up in Angola. This, the, the, one of the prime ones that you find in markets and along roadways, your milk caps are characterized by, they, they often exude this, this milky latex from their, their stems. Um, some of the most common and most sought after edible mushrooms in 
Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, these color uh, countries. Unfortunately, in South Africa, we don't get, get these guys, but very, very tasty guys, and a, a lot of species in Angola. A few others, just for interest's sake, this one in the group called the gastroids. Um, they grow mostly semi-submerged or underground. Um, also eaten by some people, not by others, depends on the tribes, at least in Zambia. A lot of the information is from Zambia or Mozambique or Tanzania, where Scandinavians have done a lot of work. This one, very small. This is one of the genera that's been red listed in Europe, and I'm finding a lot of them in Angola also. Uh, they don't like disturbed areas. <coughs> Wrapping up some of the, the edible ones, um, they recognize Vili. This is one of the termite associates. So a lot of these fungi are very specific. You can't cultivate them. So if you want to start a business growing this guy, the, the Asians have tried for decades. They can't cultivate this. They don't know what the, the termites do to grow them, but humans haven't been able to duplicate that, um, but very sought after. So there's a high diversity of macro fungi alone, not even looking at the others in Angola. It's been a limited collection so far, one sort of spring collection, one summer collection, um, and I'm sure there's many other species out there to be collected. And just to wrap up with the title, the, the Threads of Life, many of these fungi and Miombo forests are well known for it, is that many of the macro fungi are mycorrhizal. So they buffer plants against drought. They help them with nutrient uptake. And recent research has shown that these fungal threads actually move water and nutrients um, not just between the fungus here and the plant but between different plants and they help with communication. Um, so losing the trees and the macro environment in Angola would mean losing a lot of these mycorrhizal fungi that are very specific and losing a lot of the, the food sources and the alternative um, sources of nutrition to the, the people in the areas. And with that, thank you everybody and thanks to, to the teams that have supported us and helped us with with getting in there and, and doing the collections. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.